chapter 11, reading from the New King James Version. The scripture is not on the screen, but I hope you bring the Bibles to church as well. I'm old school. Bring your Bible to church. Genesis chapter 11, verse 31. And Terah took his son Abel and his grandson Lot, the son of Haran, and his daughter in law Sarai, his son Abram's wife. And they went out with them from Ur of the Chaldeans to go to the land of Canaan. And they came to Haran and dwelt there. For the days of Terah were 205 years, and Terah died in Haran. Chapter 12, verse 1 says, Now the Lord had said to Abram, Get out of your country, from your family, from your father's house, to a land that I will show you. I will make you a great nation. I will bless you and make your name great. I will bless those who bless you and I will curse them who curse you. And in you, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. So Abram departed as the Lord had spoken to him and Lot went with him. And Abram was 75 year old, years old when he departed from then Abram took Sarai, his wife, and Lot, his brother's son, and all their possessions that they had, that they had gathered, and the people whom they had acquired in the land, and they departed to go to the land of Canaan. So they came to the land of Canaan. Abram passed through the land to the place of Shechem, as far as the prisoner's tree of Moriah, and the Canaanites were, in, were then in the land. Then the Lord appeared to Abram and said, To your descendants I will give this there he built an altar to the Lord who had appeared to him. And he moved from there to the mountain east of Bethel, and he pitched his tent with Bethel on the west and Ai on the east. <clears throat> there he built an altar to the Lord and called on the name of the Lord. Verse 9, so Abram journeyed, going on still toward the south. Amen. I want to talk some thoughts today, the great PCS. Yeah, the great PCS. How many, with the exception of myself, have recently PCS too? All in the back. <laughs> all right. How many on your way out the door? I got a few. All right. Well, for my audience that uh, will listen to this later, uh, we all know PCS to be a uh, permanent change of station. And according to military one source, most of our experiences, uh, the PCS is a unique opportunity to experience life in different parts of the country and the world. Uh, it's an invitation to a new adventure, allowing one or a family to experience both diverse cultures and environments. Uh, terms that are familiar to us as CONUS and PCS within the United States, O CONUS, which is where we are today outside the United States. And we know that assignments are typically two to four years. Uh, now with this opportunity comes excitement, <clears throat> but also this opportunity is packaged with anxiety and high potential for change in one's attitude. And you hear me clearing my throat a lot, it's because something attacked me uh, when I got here. <laughs> I took a use neck before I came up. <clears throat> All right, so from our two transitions, Jennifer and I, I've discovered the unnecessary stresses of carrying tomorrow's burden with today's happenings. Uh, according to George MacDonald, the Scottish poet, no man ever sunk under the burden of the day. It's when tomorrow's burden is added to the burden of today that the weight is more than a man can bear. Never loathe yourself, for if you find yourself so loaded, at least remember this, it is your own doing not God, for he begs you to leave the future to him while you mind the present. Truth be told, the burdens that weigh us down are the ones we cannot see and perhaps are not meant to see in the moment. Amen. Fanny Cosby, the marvelous writer of many of our hymns, lived to be 95 years old. She was blind all her life, but what a perspective on life she had. When she was eight years old, she wrote, oh, what a happy child I am, although I cannot see. I'm determined that in this world, content I will be. 
How many blessings I enjoy that other people don't? The weak inside, because I'm blind, I cannot and I won't. Uh, on her grave in Bridgeport, Connecticut, lies a simple little headstone with the name Aunt Tammy, followed by these few words. And I think we're all familiar with them. Blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. Oh, what a foretaste of glory divine. Dear friends, there's a lesson for us that dwells in the life of Aunt Fanny. That although we may not see, we must be determined that contented we will be. And that to weak inside, because we may be blind, we cannot and we won't. Because when Jesus is ours, yes. he has everything we need. Amen. Now, the story of Abraham is the first two suggestion encounter in the Bible. All of us know you cannot make this move without order. Amen. Amen. All right. I'm a Baptist preacher, so I like a little response every now and then. All right. Life, however, will allow us to move wherever we desire. But the move may not be categorized as a TCS if God did not tell us to move. Mm. The latter part of Genesis chapter 11 is where this story begins. For here we're given the genealogy of Abram's father, Terah. Of Noah's three sons, Terah is a descendant of Shem. According to Genesis chapter 9, verse 26, Shem is blessed. He was a distinguished person, and the men of Babel sought to make themselves a name and become rivals of Shem. However, his greatness rose from the fact that he was a forerunner of Jesus Christ. Shem's name, being renowned, foreshadowed the great name above every name for which every knee should bow. So in offering praise to God after the sin of his younger son Ham, Noah makes this declaration, blessed be the Lord, the God of Shem. Genesis chapter 11, verse 27, Terah is introduced having three sons also, one of which was potentially named after his grandfather, Nahor. The sons of Terah are Abram, Nahor, and Haran, and the Bible records that Terah lived 75 years when he had off. Put a bookmarker there, bookmark number one. Terah lived 75 years when he had offspring. Now verse 27 adds that Haran had a son named Lot. And immediately into verse 28, we learn that Lot's father has died. His cause of death is not mentioned, and all we know is that he died with a son remaining. Following the death of their brother, the writer tells us, the writer Moses tells us, Abram and Nahor get married. Abram married Sarai, and Nahor married Milcah, who was the daughter of his deceased brother Haran. She had a sister named Issachar, and there is nothing else mentioned of her in the text or the Bible. So now we see that Haran died, not leaving just one son, but two daughters for a total of three children. Randomly, though, in verse 30, it mentions Sarai's barrenness. She is without child. Why is this important enough to mention and have a verse all second bookmark for the bookmarker right there. Arriving at today's passage, Terah has taken his son Abram, grandson Lot, and daughter-in-law Sarai from their native land en route to Canaan. But while en route to Canaan, they stopped in Haran and settled there. Verse 32 of chapter 11 tells us that having lived 205 years, Terah died at the halfway point. Now let's go back. Terah had three sons and one died before him. There may be someone sitting here today that has experienced the loss of a child. I want to assure you that God has prepared you, in spite of your loss, to care for the children that remain. Let me say that again. God has prepared you, in spite of your loss, to care for those that remain. Amen. Following his loss, the next thing we learn of Terah is that he uproots Abel, Lot, and Sarai from Ur of the Chaldeans. And if you're curious like me, you may be questioning the purpose for which they moved. Honestly, we don't know, but what we do know is that God was at work. Now, I don't know if Tara left for reasons of grief or had an undocumented conversation with God and her son Abram, uh, who, who we later find out heard from God. All we know is that they left for Canaan. Tara, whose name means turning or wandering, turned or wandered away from something in earth. But he stops in Haran 
causing question of his intention to go to Cambridge. Before I present the application, I think it's beneficial to know that Ur was a place of idol worship, and Haran was a well-known caravan city, which was also a place of idolatry, driven worship to the pagan moon gods. While I don't know why he left Ur, then settled in Haran, based upon this information, it is clear that he settled in a place that was familiar to him. In other words, Haran had more to offer than Mildenhall. I mean, Ur. <laughs> <laughs> Excuse me, I got that mixed up. First point I want us to deal with today is doing it yourself. You know it as did you. Doing it yourself. In transition of the PCS, we have the option to do a Diddy movie. Uh, Jennifer and I have not done one. However, after completing our first PCS, I learned that some people completed a Diddy move for the money. Now, I already don't like to pack a bag for overnight stay. So at present, I'm not interested in moving anywhere and having to do it myself. Because it means more work for us. And it's not reported that Tara received any instruction from God to move. Yet it is read that he did it on his own. Although God was behind the scenes working, Tara didn't make it where he had intended to go. Instead, he stopped halfway. Have you ever traveled locally a long distance and decided to drive to your destination? Along the highway you pass a rest area, and here I would use the term the parking area. For me, depending upon how far I am from my destination, I may not stop. I want to go as far as I can. Of my travel alone, this may not always be possible, but when I am alone, I may not stop because of three reasons. Number one, it's easy to want to stretch longer than I am. Secondly, stopping too long limits the projected time to reach my destination. And thirdly, it's possible I won't end up where I intended to go. If God had any interaction with Tara, Tara is a type of many who step out for Christ, but whose hopes of discipleship die halfway. Mm -hmm. They start in the spirit and they end in the flesh. Mm -hmm. Tara lost sight of his destination for focusing on the momentary pleasures of what was only meant to be a stop, a rest, a parking area. And yes, we need rest in this life from the things we've turned or wandered from, but that rest isn't meant for us to go backwards or settle in places that possess similarities to the people and things we've left. Yes, come on. Amen. Understand that when you settle as terror did for less than your final destination, you will die where you are. Mm -hmm. Genesis chapter 11 begins with man's attempt to unify humankind, yet ends with God's provision to unify all humans in blessing with Abram's descendants because the next recorded event will be God's call of Abraham and the promises from God to him. Our second point today is moving by government carrier. Moving by government carrier. As stated previously, when the PCS, there's the option of doing it yourself or getting some help from the king's pastor. And if you don't know this, life is a little bit easier have some help. Amen. Genesis chapter 12 verse 1 reads, Now the Lord had said to Abram, Get out of your country, from your family, and from your father's house, to a land that I will show you. Some scholars suggest this verse reflects God's instruction to Abram while on earth, which is reported in Acts chapter 7 verse 2, uh, where Stephen is at the synagogue of the free men, uh, being accused of blasphemy. Acts chapter 7, verse 2 says, And he said, Brethren and fathers, listen. The God of glory appeared to our father Abraham when he was in Mesopotamia before he dwelt in Haran. Other scholars suggest that God's instruction to Abram took place while they were in Haran. Now, whether in Ur or Haran doesn't really matter. What does matter is Abram's obedience to listen to a God he did not know or serve. Mm. Scripture doesn't state any of this, but it's highly possible. That Abram experienced doubt, excitement, anxiety, separation, and an identity shift, all to obey what the Lord had said. After all, Abram had to leave the people and the things that gave him a sense of security and identity. And 
watch this, what we'll see shortly, that God's call isn't directed to the husband, or in our case, the military member alone, but to everyone that is in the house. Mm -hmm. All God needed from Abram to accomplish his will and to shower his blessings was an obedient heart. Mm -hmm. God tells Abram to go. Following that instruction, he tells Abram what will happen if he accepts his assignment. He says, I will make you a great nation. I will bless you and make your name great. And because of what God will do for Abram, Abram is to be a blessing to others. For it says, you shall be a blessing. God says, I will bless those who bless you. I will curse him who curse you. And because I will bless and curse those who yield eager to you, and you, Abram, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. Abram heard all of this, and it must have sounded really good to him. I mean, better than the life and wealth he presently had, because verse 4 says, Abram departs, and his nephew Lot, who must have gotten wind of all this, decided he didn't want to be left out. So he goes with him. And look at the end of verse 4. And Abram was 75 years old when he departed from Haran. Y'all mean it? Remember how many bookmarks we had? How many? How many? Two. That's nice. You got something else I can check. We had two. The first one, earlier I referenced Genesis chapter 11, where it states Terah is 75 years old with three sons. Here in Genesis chapter 12, verse 4, Abram is 75 years old with the promise to be a great nation of blessing all families of earth. When I think of terror, I reflect on the words of Dr. King recorded in the book titled The Measure of a Man. King says, there is something within all of us that causes us to cry out with honesty. Lord, make me pure, but not yet. There is something within all of us that causes us to affirm with the Apostle Paul, the good that I would, I do not. And the evil that I would not, I do. And so in a real sense, the isness of our present nature is out of harmony with the external oughtness that forever confronts us. We know how to love and yet we hate. We take the precious lives that God has given us and throw them away in wrath and living. We are unfaithful to those whom we should be faithful. We are disloyal to those ideals to which we should be loyal. And we, like sheep, have gone astray. King goes on to say, I don't know about you, but when I look at myself hard enough, I don't feel like crying with the Pharisee. Lord, I thank thee that I am not like other men. But I find myself crying out, Lord, be merciful unto me, a sinner. For we are sinners in need of God's divine grace. But when I think of Abram, I reflect on the words of Deborah Lee James, the 23rd Secat, in her book, Aim High. Secretary James wrote, the most fulfilling purpose in life is when you contribute to the betterment and well-being of others. Amen. Ultimately, this means being a part of an endeavor that is bigger than you are. Yes, Terah started out with others in mind, but died of his own pleasure, whereas Abram obeyed God with you and me in mind. Our second bookmark reference Genesis chapter 11, verse 30, where it's recorded that Abram's wife Sarai was without child. Once again, we question why this piece of information has its own verse. God already knew what God was going to do. If you recall, Ur and Moran were places of idol worship, and God preserved his seed from an unhealthy environment. Simply put, it wasn't her place or her season of blessing. Mm. Now please note that a woman during this time was ashamed if she could not bear her husband a child. And there may be someone here today living in shame. You hated your last assignment, or things didn't go as you have hoped for in some point of your, of your life. May I tell you, it wasn't the right place or season for God to impregnate you with what you desire. Mm. You, have, you would have suffered a miscarriage along the journey. Terah was 75 with three sons, yet Abel was 75 with a suitcase and a trunk. Mm -hmm. Let's look at verse 5 through 9, then chapter 12. Genesis chapter 5 says, 
Then Abram took Sarai, his wife, and Lot, his brother's son, and all their possessions that they had gathered, and the people whom they had acquired in the ram, and they departed to go to the land of Canaan. So they came to the land of Canaan. Abram passed through the land in the place of Shechem, as far as the timber of the tree of Moriah, and the Canaanites were then in the land. Verse 7, then the Lord appeared to Abram and said, to your descendants I will give this land, and there he built an altar to the Lord who had appeared to him. And he moved from there to the mountain east of Bethel, and he pitched his tent with Bethel on the west, and Ai on the east. There he built an altar to the Lord and called on the name of the Lord. Verse 9, so Abram journeyed, going on still toward the south. Our last point, find a place to worship. Then continue with the journey. At this point, Abram has chosen to obey God and continued the journey that started with his father to Canaan, with his wife Sarai, his nephew Lot, and all the possessions and people they had acquired in Haran. When you move by government carriers, you're moving with hell. The Bible says they arrive in Canaan, but watch, they don't settle in Canaan because it's still occupied by the Canaanites. Just because God tells you to go to a specific place and you follow in obedience, don't be in a hurry to take over when you arrive. Take the time to understand the lay of the land and wait for God for additional instructions. Abram follows God by faith without any knowledge of what lies ahead. As he passed through Canaan, he came to a place called Shechem, and it is at Shechem where the Lord appears to Abram, and this time God doesn't talk to Abram concerning him individually, but this time God says, to your descendants, I will give this land. And Abram does something that we all need to do. He built an altar marking the place that the Lord appeared to him. You can build an altar in your workspace or wherever you're sent without mentioning the creator, the savior, and the sustainer while you wait to take possession of what God has promised. In verse 8, moved from Shechem to the mountain east of Bethel and pitched his tent with Bethel on the west and Ai on the east. And here he built another altar to the Lord. But by this time, he does something he didn't do the first time. The Bible says this time he called on the name of the Lord. At first, it was God speaking to Abram. But after a while, God became real to Abram that Abram had to speak to him for himself. God has blessed us and shown his hand of favor in our lives time and time again. And I want to admonish us not to take another step on the journey without calling on the name of the Lord. Abram wasn't looking for God, but God found him. And once you've encountered him for yourself, you can begin to worship him for who he is. A bishop in the Church of England by the name of William Temple says that when we understand worship, we will know that worship is to quicken the conscience by the holiness of God, to feed the mind with the truth of God, to purge the imagination by the beauty of God, to open up the heart to the love of God, and to devote that will and purpose of God. A last slide. When we worship, we can look beyond our obstacles and see Christ at the center of our responsibility. Take comfort in knowing that what's coming is better than what's been. Amen. In his final remarks before his PCS to Texas, Chaplain Reagan left us with these words. The Lord is watching over our coming and our going. Yes. Amen. Thank you.